and I'm going to send you uh, one of the things I told Jalal was the re reason that I didn't want to well I maybe I didn't make this very precise I wanted to get a feel for the class in the first in the very first lecture and I may make some slight changes in the in the delivery and in terms of the content just based on where everybody is uh, so lecture zero just is going to go through some of the fundamentals that I need so that I can convey this material. The material is going to be a little mathematically um, advanced uh, and I'm going to be a, obviously looking at lots of specific models in electricity markets but the emphasis will be to try and relate, the, relate those to well-known variational and optimization problems and give you an understanding of how to analyze and solve these problems okay, in a range of settings including deterministic, stochastic, hierarchical um, and, and so I won't be kind of unloading a whole plethora of different models the hope is to give you the tools and techniques to solve a broad class of them so I'll be spending a little more time on the analysis and the computational question okay. and so along the way you know I just want this to be more of a dialogue so if you feel like there are questions that I've not addressed stop me if I can address them I will if I can't I can take them offline and I'll do so okay so today for the first part of the in the morning what I'm going to do is just go through three parts uh, the analysis so look at some basics that we need to cover just to make sure everybody's on the same page uh, I was hoping to send this out earlier but the reason I didn't do that is I really didn't you know when I got the surveys back I realized there's a fair amount of breadth and so my hope is to kind of emphasize some aspects so I'll do that adaptively in the afternoon I'll start looking at um, a set of models which is going to span the, the areas that I mentioned ranging from deterministic to stochastic to hierarchical where we look at a specific um, you know we'll, we'll actually use a specific class of electricity market models and then from tomorrow we look at analysis of a subclass of these okay oh this is my deep goodness oh this is awful So it's only in the morning that I'll be doing this. Later on, I'm going to start going to the board. So um, I apologize for this. Uh, okay. So so today we'll just spend the first few hours looking at covering some of these these notions. Um, so we'll start by just reminding everybody that we'll be working in a vector space. Um, so we'll be considering the space of n-dimensional real vectors. And whenever I talk about a vector, the vector will be viewed as a column vector, right? If I use a prime or a transpose, it just represents the transpose of the vector. For any matrix, I will use this block to emphasize which elements are being employed, or I might just say capital AIJ. Um, you know, the problem is that I don't have the converter for... No, no, but for the laser, you can... Oh, okay, yeah, I can do that. So, yeah, I could do that, but it's okay. So I'll, you know, so essentially what we're going to be, so sometimes I find that I'm not mentioned something on the, on the slide. So we're going to use this notation. Okay. So A is positive, semi, positive definite if X transpose AX is greater than zero for all X not equal to zero. Okay. Um, and it's greater than or equal to zero when A is uh, when when that inequality is is weak. Okay. Um, vectors x and y, the inner product is x prime y or x transpose y. We'll be using largely we'll be using Euclidean norms. Okay. So the Euclidean norm of a vector is basically the sum of the the square root of the sum of the squares, right? On or more generally, we can just write this as is just x transpose x okay and I'll tell you about some of the uh, requirements on a particular metric to be a norm um, we also have the uh, the one norm which is basically the sum of the absolute values and the infinity norm which is the sum which is the max of the absolute values of the elements okay the matrix norm so if you have a, if you have a matrix the question is what is the appropriate specification of the norm of a matrix and there are a variety of those okay so this is one such so this is a, a matrix norm that is induced by the vector norm so for instance if I have 
There's a, there's a duster somewhere. Oh, is this the one? Okay. Oh, it's great. Wow. It's funny. It looks like a large sponge, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. So, um, so this is actually induced. So, for instance, if I say the two norm, then you're going to get supremum of ax two. Right, and so uh, of course. So if this is the infinity norm, it'll be the infinity norm of the matrix. Now, of course, there's also the Frobenius norm. I'm not going to get into those here, but that's that's the definition of a matrix norm. Um, these are the properties of a norm. Okay, so for instance, the norm has to provide you with a non-negative, essentially evaluates into a non-negative. Scalar. There's a uniqueness of the zero value. So norm x is equal to zero if and only if x is equal to zero. There's a t missing here. It's homogeneity. So what that means is the norm of the scalar multiply uh, the the scalar um, the scaling of a vector norm of okay right and you have. all x and um, so this is if and only if x is equal to 0 and then finally you have the triangle inequality okay the distance between two vectors is just going to be the, so, and this distance is, if I measure this, for instance, in the Euclidean sense or in the two-norm sense, it's just the square root of the sum of the, the square distances. Okay. Vectors x and y are said to be orthogonal when x transpose y is equal to zero, and uh, for orthogonal vectors, you essentially have the Pythagorean theorem holding. Right. This is an extremely useful in inequality, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Um, I think there's a T extra there should be Schwartz. So I'm not used to these boards which can slide down, so I, I needn't actually erase, right? I can keep doing this, right? So so. So that's the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Um, okay. So one of the, the the aspects of this course which I'm going to rely on is the ability to say something about sequences. And this is, you know, ideally, of course, it would be nice if everybody had a background in real analysis. I know people come with different backgrounds. So what I'm going to provide you with over the next maybe half an hour is to give you some understanding of what it means when a sequence is said to be bounded, when it's convergent, what is the notion of an accumulation or a limit point. Um, and, and the reason why this is useful is when I talk about the convergence properties of an algorithm, I need to tell you something about whether the sequences that the algorithm generates do indeed converge to a solution of the problem. Right? What does it mean for you, for us to say this algorithm provides you with a conversion sequence. It's a useful algorithm. Right? It, what we need to provide a justification for is that the algorithm produces a sequence and that sequence does indeed converge to a solution that we're interested in. Okay? So let's, let's talk a bit about that. So, so before I start, how many of you have had a background in real analysis at the graduate level? Any of you? Okay, a few. Okay. So and so, uh, before I do that, I want to make sure that I, I, I give you some. Um, oh yeah, here's the dust. I want to give you some understanding of what. So let me give you a simple example. Okay. Suppose I gave you a simple problem like this: minimize f of x, where x lies in Rn. Okay. Let's assume. Assume that. F. Is continuously differentiable. Okay. 
will tap this otherwise it'll hold this whole thing. Okay. And what I in if in effect I can always evaluate gradients. Okay. So one simple method for solving this problem is the celebrated gradient method, right? So what is the gradient method? Uh, how is the gradient method articulated? So given an x naught, so you give me an x naught, and I generate a sequence x k plus one is x k minus some alpha k gradient of f of x k k greater than zero. Okay, so that's a gradient method. Right, it's a very simple method, right? Now, if I give you or if I provide you with a method, then what I need to provide you with, if this algorithm is a useful algorithm, I need to provide you with a guarantee that xk, xk does indeed converge to some point. Now, let's assume for the time being, and I haven't defined convexity yet, but I don't even need f to be convex. F could be continuously differentiable, not necessarily convex, just differentiable. This could be, you know, to a stationary point. So does this happen as k goes to infinity? Right? As k goes to infinity, does xk get closer and closer to x star? Right? The second question is, if it doesn't indeed converge, what rate does it converge at? Right? What does it mean to specify the rate? So what I mean by that is, can I provide you with a scalar that's for which this relationship holds? So this is one rate. It's called the linear rate of convergence. K greater than zero. So does there exist, does there, this is exist, a Q which is less than one such that this holds? And why, why is this useful? Because what this tells us is the distance from xk plus 1 to x star reduces by a finite amount at every step, right? So now I'm, I'm making a statement about an algorithm, but for me to prove these types of statements, I need to use tools of analysis, okay? And so I need to say something about sequence. I need to say something about when sequences are bounded. So what is a bounded sequence? A bounded sequence is one where for every iterate in that sequence, the norm of xk is less than some finite scalar. Okay? So let's give some examples of that. So for instance, let me give you an example. So if I gave you a sequence xk is, uh, let's just say this one, 1 upon 2 raised to k minus 1 upon 2 raised to k, right? So we know that norm xk, so norm xk in this case, if you look at this, this is 1 upon 2 raised to k. So this is obviously less than 1 in absolute values, right? So this is going to be what? Square root of 1 upon 2 raised to 2k plus 1 upon 2 raised to 2k which is less than 1 upon 2 plus 1 upon 2, which is less than 1. Okay, so there's some scalar that you can find such that for all k, this holds. Right. You know, you'd think that I'd be able to just change the but I can't change it because the university has control on all parameters of this. So if I need to change even the, the time before the screensaver comes on, I have to get the IT guy involved and I have to write forms and triplicate for that. So anyway, so, so this is boundedness of sequence. Now you might, you might ask, why do I care whether a sequence is bounded? Because when a sequence is bounded, then I can extricate from it a convergent subsequence. And I'll tell you what a subsequence is. Okay, so next, a sequence is said to converge to a vector x tilde when the limit of x tilde minus xk in norm is equal to zero. Where did I chuck that little piece of chalk? Okay, so 
we say x k converges to if the limit of okay okay now it turns out so here i'm going to say something about there's a subsequence so what is a subsequence a subsequence is me and it is best done with an example so if i gave you a sequence like this suppose i gave you a sequence 1 half 1 quarter 1 eighth right so you can see the sequence is is tending to zero right i can pull out so this is called xk right in this case xk is just 1 upon 2 raised to k where k is greater than or equal to 0 right i can pull out something called a subsequence so the subsequence has indices k sub j okay so essentially its values are k xk1 xk2 xk3 so for instance in the context of this sequence it would be you know maybe i said k1 is 1 k2 is 3 k3 is 5 and so on so you'd get a subsequence 1 1 fourth 1 eighth and this of course also goes to 0 okay you could get a different one you could say 1 10 11 or whatever right you could just choose something right so now what is important about this is that the sequence itself need not converge but under some conditions a subsequence always will right you can always find a subsequence that will always converge so here's a simple case so suppose i gave you this sequence um so if you took this sequence what you find is you find that this sequence is not convergent what do i mean by not convergent i mean that essentially as k goes to infinity what's happening if k is odd that's you know it's going to zero oh sorry even it's going to zero and if it's odd it's just staying at one so i'll make sure everybody understands that right you can see it odd iterates of the sequence are always one right even iterates are essentially half a quarter an eighth a sixteenth and so on and those are going to zero do you see that left here do you see that so now what you can observe from this is that the sequence itself is not convergent which means that the entire sequence is not converging to one limit point the limit point is essentially what the sequence tends to um, but you can find a subsequence that does now is that always the case can i always find a subsequence that converges to a limit point no what you need is boundedness so if i tell you that the sequence is bounded and what did i define boundedness as i said that if i can get an a priori scalar such that the norm of the vector is always smaller than this so what i mean by that just intuitively in your head what you should be thinking is boundedness just means that if I have a sequence and it's going in some, I need to be able to put a big ball around it and the sequence stays inside the ball. As long as the sequence stays inside the ball, I can find a subsequence that is convergent. Okay. And that's exactly what the Bolzano theorem says. It says a bounded sequence has at least one limit point. And what is another way of saying that is there's at least one subsequence which is convergent. And if that subsequence is convergent, it's converging to a point, and that point is a limit point okay that's Bolzano's theorem it's very important and the reason why it's very important is in lots of settings that we work with right all of us we work on problems in power markets or in power systems you're actually working in settings where you've got finite capacities you've got capacity you've got transmission constraints so the the problems that you're working with are effectively generating sequences that are 
by definition bounded. And the reason why they're bounded is because you've got bounded capacities, bounded transmission limits or whatever. And if you know that, then you know that this, there are convergent subsequences. And if you have a convergent subsequence, then what you can then do is you need to then prove that that convergent subsequence does indeed converge to a limit point that is the solution of the problem. But you've taken care of one point. You've, you know that the subsequence is bounded. It's not always a guarantee, right? It's, it's always tough to find these types of results. Okay. Now, obviously, I can't do you know, all of analysis in, in, in this period. But the hope is to give you enough of an exposure. And when we are doing the actual analysis of certain results, I'll expose you to more. Okay. Um, so here's some set topology that we'll, that we'll find useful. So a set, uh, sorry, a vector x is said to be an accumulation point of a set if there is a sequence xk such that xk tends to x. So what I mean by that, bless you, is that if I give you a set and I say that a point is uh, an accumulation or limit point of that set, it means that I have to be able to find a sequence that converges to that set, uh, to that point. So if I gave you a set and I said, hey, this is a limit point, then you need to be able to find a sequence that converges to this for you to claim it's a limit point. The set X is said to be closed if it contains all its limit points. And a set X is open if its complement set is closed. Okay, so let me give you some examples of this. Right, some, some quick examples of closeness, how it affects us. So, so let's take this open interval. So this is going to op called an open interval. So, so one way to define closeness and openness is in terms of accumulation points. The other way that I like to define a set uh, as the, the openness of a set is using the following result. A set X is said to be open if for all x in x, there exists a ball b of x r and r is sufficiently small such that B of XR is a subset of X. Okay, so that's a bit of a mouthful, but I want to give you an example of that. Okay, so what I'm saying is that if I gave you a set and I said, hey, this set is open, it means that for every point, if you give me a point, I need to be able to get a ball around it that's arbitrarily, that can be arbitrarily small, and that ball has to be entirely inside this set. So for instance, if I gave you, if I gave you this set, Right? So for this set, do you think this set is open or closed? Closed. And, and if you wanted to say that, if you wanted to show that it's, it's not open, right? So there are a variety of ways to do it. But one simple way is to say, let's take the point zero and draw a ball around it. Right? If you drew a ball around it, that ball would be that, right? And can that ever be included? Can that, does that ever lie in this for any choice of epsilon? No, because it leaks over, right? So I want to make sure everybody understands this. This is the closed interval. If I take a point here, the ball is this, right? So if you're on the boundary, this can never work, right? And so that's the issue with closed sets. If a set is closed and you're on the boundary, because a closed set it contains its boundary, if you take a point on the boundary and you draw a ball around and that ball is arbitrarily small, it still can't be brought within the set, right? And so that such a set is called an open set, its complement is closed. Remember what the complement is? The complement is everything outside the set, okay? So Rn and the empty set are the only sets that are both open and closed. Uh, a set is said to be compact and this is only true in Rn, okay, in more general spaces, there it's, it's a little more complicated. A set is said to be compact if it is both closed and bounded. I want to make sure that you remember this. 
The notion of compactness is crucial because it helps us prove existence. So if I tell you that the set is compact, it, it carries a lot of weight. So closeness means based on this and boundedness is this. If I have both of these holding, lots of good things happen. But in a lot of cases, I lose boundedness. For instance, if I'm looking at in electricity markets, you're often competing in prices. Now, unless you put a price cap, prices can go unbounded. Now, if you impose an artificial cap, is he looking? Oh, please, that's fine. No, no, don't worry. If you, if you put in a price cap and it's an artificial bound, the optimal, the equilibrium might actually be at the bound, right? So your, your actual prescription of the bound will actually result in specifying the equilibrium itself. That's not particularly useful, right? So, so you want to solve this problem in an unbounded sense. If, if, if there is a natural bound that's been imposed, it's great. But if you put in a bound just to analyze the problem, then the answer will be a consequence of the parameter or the bound that you've chosen. And that's not particularly nice, right? That's not for me, I'm pretty sure. Okay, so we've talked about limit points, closeness, openness, boundedness, and compactness. This will show up when we look at games and existence questions. Um, if Xi is a family of closed sets, the intersection is closed. When the set is finite, the union is closed. So remember, finite unions are closed, infinite intersections are closed. Okay, so this has to be finite. Okay, so an, uh, an example of this, just make sure everybody's on the same page. This chalk? Yep. Oh, excellent. <laughs> I just want white. But... Oh, this is white. Oh, there you go. Oh, there. Okay, good. I was wondering where my chalk went. Okay. Um... Okay, so um, okay. So anyway, let's, let's move on from that. I don't think that's as important. Okay. Yeah. Can you ask questions? Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, closed and bounded. Aren't they redundant? No. Um, closed. Closed really talks about containing its limit points. Boundedness just means that essentially I can envelop the entire set in a ball. You can have closed sets which are not bounded. This set, for instance, is a closed set, but it's not bounded. You know, another set that is a closed set is this, right? Because I essentially, I can, if x, so for instance, if, uh, if I have an x that satisfies this, let's, you know, take a simple case, take summation of x less greater than 1. Right? I can go to infinity. So this set is closed, but not bounded. Now, I could flip this. So this is bounded, sorry, closed, not bounded. And then I can go the other way, bounded, not closed. And an example of that is summation of xi less than 1. So this is strict, right? So this is bounded. Right, I should make sure I put this here. Um, you know, so you say again another open set, right? So this is basically this set, right? What is that set? That set is just this in two D, but the boundary is not included. Sorry, this boundary is not included, right? Um, so no, so you, uh, the sets can be open, uh, sorry, closed but not bounded, bounded but not closed, right? Could easily happen. Okay, so then, so then, let's talk about some special sets. So if X is a set in Rn, we say that X is a subspace when alpha plus beta y lies in x for every x and y in x and any alpha beta in r, right? So, so if you look at this, is a subspace a closed set? You can see that subspaces are closed. Are they bounded? 
not necessarily a subspace can go off to plus infinity, right? You can, vectors on that can go off. So, so I want to just make sure, let me give you something, some, a more physical understanding. So, for instance, if I said, um, so if I said x was a set of x such that, uh, let's take a very simple case. Um, let's just take um, um, x1 plus x2 is less than 1. And so this is x. Okay. Now, alpha x plus beta y, so if I call this some z, this is the set of alpha x plus beta y such that x and y lie in x. Okay, so what does this mean? Oh, there's a beta here. This just means that these vectors are formed using that. So for instance, if I said alpha x, alpha x is basically taking a vector from here. I right? suppose this is the vector and it takes it and moves here, right? And this is by some multiple alpha. Alpha could be less than one, greater than one, doesn't matter. It's just some number on the real line. It could be in the other direction, right? Could be anything. Similarly, beta, another scaling of another vector. Could be here, could be here. And now what you've done is you've created a space of all such vectors. And that represents the subspace. Okay, the subspace basically uses capital X as the basis to create the subspace. Right? Now you can see from this, it's not necessarily this was bounded. The alpha X plus beta Y needn't be, because alpha and beta itself are not bounded. They're scalars on the real line. They could be arbitrarily large. Okay? Now is it closed? It turns out that if X is closed, this is closed. Okay. Um, affine. What is an affine subspace? Affine subspace is a translated subspace. So if I take a, another vector x, uh, sorry, uh, a set x, and I look at it as the addition of x plus s. Let me give you another example for that. So suppose I say this. This is the, you know, the thing I just defined, which is this set. And if I move it to the right, what do I, how do I move it? I just say x is x plus 1, 0 such that x lies in, uh, let's call this s. So in this case, x lies in x and x is, this, uh, x is defined outside, that's x. Okay, so what I've done is, look at this, this is 1. 1, and I move it, and now this becomes 2, this stays 1, okay? Okay, so this is called, what I've done is now I've moved it, right? So now this is, in this particular case, this is, um, some x is, lies in this set x, and now we can have a subspace for this. So this was just one vector. Now I can actually draw this from some subspace. And so I get what is called an affine subspace, okay? A cone, okay? And I'm gonna give you some examples of this. So, and cones, now why are cones important? The reason cones are important is that they show up in the definition of a very important class of variational problems. And those are complementarity problems. So a cone is a set such that for any vector in that set, if I multiply that vector by a non-negative scalar, that vector stays on the set. Okay? So for instance, if I have a point here, I multiply it by a non-negative scalar, it just moves the entire set. So the, the entire set of vectors set to lie in this cone. Okay? So let me give you an example. I have a picture on the next page. Uh, sorry, I have another one oh, it's downstream, okay. 
Okay, I have a conical hull. I have another picture, but let's not worry about that now. So let me give you some examples of that. So, so here's one, here's, here's a particular uh, x non-negative, right? So x non-negative is basically this, the non-negative orthant is a cone, right? I take any vector on that, right? I take any vector, say a u, and that lies in, this is r2 plus. So the notation is important. R represents real value. Two represents the dimension. Plus represents the non-negativity. So if u is an R2 plus, lambda u is also an R2 plus if lambda is non-negative. Okay. So cone is essentially is, is a set of vectors such that when you scale them by a non-negative scalar, then that that vector is also lies in the cone. Convexity. Convexity is possibly the most important topological notion that we're going to study. And I'm going to just define that here. A set C is said to be convex if lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y lies in x or lies in C if x, y lie in C and lambda lies in 0, 1. So this E here means is an element of. Okay, so when I say lambda is an element of this interval, it means lambda takes on values between 0 and 1. So if I ever write something and the notation is not clear, just stop me because sometimes I forget that I've not defined notation. Okay, so just stop me if there's something that you don't see. What is the, the geometry of this? I'll give you a set, take two points in the set, the line segment has to lie in the set. Okay, that's all that it means. Right? So I take two points, x, y. This point is lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y. Right? If I take lambda closer and closer to 1, I get this. If I take lambda closer and closer to 0, I get that. And I can get every other point in this line segment by the appropriate choice of lambda. Right? So now the only question that remains is, does the line segment lie in the set? Well, it does if the set is convex. But if the set was... Now you might say, oh, look, this line segment lies in the set. Is it convex? No. The failure of the convexity property comes from being able to find some line segments. So look, there's a line segment that doesn't lie in the set, which means the set is not convex. Okay? So two important notions, convexity and the notion of being, in a, being a cone. Okay, important notions. So is a subspace a convex set or an affine set? It really depends on what induces it, right? So it's not difficult. In fact, I have to check in the exercises that I'll talk about, I have some of these specified. So you can see, so I want to make sure that you can look at some of this. So this is, is this set convex? It is, right? You can take any two points, you'll find that the line segment always lies in this. Clearly, this set is not convex. Now, this set, the reason why I have these darkened means that some parts of these, the boundary is included, and some it's not. But does it affect the convexity? So why wouldn't? Why would it affect the convexity? Let's think about it. That's a good point. Between these two. So if you draw a line saying between these two points, what's going to happen is that these points in the in the uh, on the line segment do not lie in the set right priyanka right is that clear so for instance if i gave you the boundary and i said look these two are in the set but any line segment is not in the set so the set cannot be convex is that clear 
Christy? Yeah. Okay. Now, um, so these are some very special convex sets. This is called the closed ball. The closed ball, the reason why I use the term closed is because the this inequality is actually weak. So the boundary of the ball or the surface of the ball is included in the set. Okay. Um, a closed ball is convex, as is an open ball. Right? Now, of course, if you have a ball where a portion of the boundary is in and a portion is out, then Okay, more convex sets. So here's a half space. Now the reason why I call something a half space is because it splits the entire, so if I gave you this, let's take, let's take a simple half space. Let's take this space x1 plus x2 less than one. Okay, now let's take the space R2. This is, now what happens is that this basically splits R2 into two half spaces, splits it into two, right? If you're here, what is it? It's x1 plus x2 strictly greater than one. And here it's x1 plus x2 less than one. And this is x1 plus x2 equals one. So the entire space has been split into two. Okay, and that's why the term half space is employed. Okay, if you just look at the boundary, so then you often refer to this as a transpose x equals b, which is just the hyperplane. A polyhedral set is just a set which is formed by a sequence of linear inequalities, or it can also be viewed as the set of a finite number of half spaces and hyperplanes, right? finite number of these gives you what is called a polyhedral set. So a set like this, this is one half space, another half space, half space. So this is a polyhedral set and the set is here. Okay, now you could also add a hyperplane to that. So then you have this is actually the only feasible part of the set. Okay. okay. So for instance, this polyhedral set is formed by these half spaces. This is A5 transpose X less than some B5, A4 transpose X less than B4, and so on. Okay. Okay, here's a very important notion of uh, an important object that uh, corresponds to a cone. It's called the dual cone. Okay, so, so if C is, uh, if, what did I call the cone? This K, right? Let K, so whenever I write subset of Rn, it means that the cone lies in Rn, right? Let K be a cone, then K star, which is the dual cone, is the set of Y such that the d transpose y is greater than zero for d in k. Oh, there I flipped it, so maybe I'll flip it here. This is d, make this zero. Okay. So let's think about this. Um, let's take a simple case. What this says is. For every vector in the dual cone, it makes an acute angle with a vector in the original cone. So this is the original cone, K. So I need to make, so, so if you look at this, so this has to be, okay. And so this is the cone K star. Because look, this vector makes a 90 degree angle with this, and every other vector makes an acute angle with every vector in K. Okay? So does everybody see the definition of K star? So K star contains vectors which form acute angles with every vector in 
the original cone. Okay, so if I gave you this cone, this angle is 90, this angle is 90. So when I say 90, I mean basically these two are, are, are orthogonal. Okay. They, they appear in the formulation of a complementarity problem and that is why they are particularly important. Right? Now, regardless of what, what here is the interesting point. Regardless of what the original cone is, this cone, the dual cone is always closed and convex. That is a very useful property. Okay, so here is a, a very specific cone called the normal cone. So the normal cone of a set is defined as the following. Okay. So let K be A closer and convex, um, you know, some non-empty set. I only need closer. Then a normal cone. A normal cone is defined as. So a normal cone is defined at a set X, of a uh, and corresponds to some set capital X and is defined as the set of Y. Okay. I want to make sure that everybody understands how we generate these. So the picture is very useful. What it says is if I gave you a set, the normal cone is, is defined at any point on that set. It might be empty, but it takes the value of that point right? and it says Find me all the vectors such that y transpose y transpose x minus x hat. So x hat is the point where the cone is being defined. Those are obtuse. So for instance, let's take this set that we gave I gave you. This is the point x hat. Okay. And now I'm interested in the set of y's such that x minus x hat is less than 0 for all x in x. So look, this is x, this is x minus x hat. So I want to make sure, I want to make sure that I could have an x here as well, right? Right? That basically I do not form an acute angle with any of these. So I get this you can see this. This is the set. So I can take this vector x minus x hat. So y transpose x minus x hat should be less than equal to 0. So this angle cannot be smaller than 90 degrees. Similarly, this is the other end of it. This angle cannot be more than 90 degrees. It cannot be less than 90 degrees. And the set of all these vectors represents the normal cone. Okay. So let me give you some examples. This is a slightly a slightly more complicated notion. Okay, so let me just give you some examples. If I gave you, say, I gave you this, the non-negative orthant, x is equal to r two plus. What is the normal cone at the origin? Sorry, of r two plus at the origin. Exactly. So it would just be this. Right? Because look, if you take two a point here, it has to form it has to form an angle that is at least 90 degrees. Okay. If I change that set and I instead of that I make it this set, how does a normal cone change? So now what's going to happen is that you need to make sure, so does it widen or shrink? It should widen, right, not shrink. The reason is that basically you have a little more room to play, right? So you can go all the way to here and this is the normal cone, right? Now if you had just a line, what do you think the normal cone is then? 
Suppose I just told you the normal cone associated with R plus or R2, but I just go in one direction. You know, I just go in this direction. What do you think the normal cone of that is? Right, the entire space here. Okay. Uh, oh, bloody heck. Yeah, you need both. Yeah. The dual cone just corresponds to the set, yeah. Sorry. What's your name? Fabio. Fabio. Okay. okay. Why are normal cones important? So the reason they're important is that, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you about it right now, so that, and because you'll see it over and over again, so it's good for me to introduce it early. Um, when you write down the optimality conditions, of a convex optimization problem. Um, so for instance, if I gave you this problem, if I gave you this problem, minimize f of x, x lying in capital X, okay? This is equivalent to, if I want a solution to this problem and I said, let's assume for the time being f is convex and capital X is a convex set, okay? Turns out, if f is differentiable, this is, getting a solution of this is equivalent to getting a solution of, and let's assume f is differentiable, gradient of f plus the normal cone. So what you've done is you've re replaced the solution of an optimization problem to the solution of something that is like an equation. It's called a generalized equation. The, why, the reason why it's a generalized because you have a, normally if, if everything was nice, you just say, Get me a solution to this. But the problem is this is a set. So you need lies it. So, so that's why it's useful. Normal cones are very useful, right? So they'll, they'll show up in all sorts of settings. And you'll find them. Again, normal cone is always closed and convex regardless of the set. So you remember the previous set that I had. The set was non-convex, but the normal cone was convex. Okay, so the set may be non-convex, but the normal cones are closer and convex. Yes, sir. Uh, so in the definitions of closeness, you talked about uh, defining a ball at every point, which uh, has the radius as small. That's the open set, yes. Uh, so in this case, how about these sets? You can define a ball of radius. So this is not, so th remember what this is. This is a generalized equation. So the notion of openness or closeness is not relevant. What is, the, what is relevant in terms of openness or closeness is in this set. And this set is closed. Okay, this set is closed. So it's a good question. But what about the non-negative orthodox, for example? So the, the non-negative orthodox is open and closed. So it's trivially closed. Non-negative, so anything R, uh, Rn, oh sorry, Rn plus is closed. Right. So, um, but it, this set is, is closed by definition of a normal cone. Okay. okay, so the 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 sister cone associated with the normal cone is called the tangent cone. Okay, so the tangent cone is uh, so before you before I kind of define it, I want you to think about. I think I had a picture of this. Ah, here it is. So this is a picture, but before I define it, I want to just give you the picture. So if you look at this, right, this is a set. And now as you get closer to x hat, what you want to keep your eye on are the tangents that correspond to this. So these are the tangents. Okay, now any sequence that converges has to lie in this for k sufficiently large. Because you could, you could start from here. You're not in the tangent cone. This is called a tangent cone. Okay. Oh, this is awful. Right, that's the tangent cone. Now you start a sequence from here. This is your x hat. 
at some point it has to enter the tangent one if it's if it's tending to x hat okay so the tangent cone represents the set of tangent vectors right it basically is enveloped by these tangent vectors so look again it's defined using a point on the set and the original set and is essentially the set of y such that y is the limit point of xk minus x hat over lambda k where xk converges to x hat and lambda k converges to 0 okay so l let me make sure that you understand so when think about this sequence that is converging this sequence basically what's happening is this represents the limit point of xk minus x hat so when xk gets closer to closer to x hat what's happening this is going to zero lambda k is going to zero and you're getting this direction that corresponds corresponds to the limit point right we look at the set of all these directions then you're left with something which is essentially the tangent cone okay another way to look at this is just so these vectors are often called the tangent vectors of the set at x hat okay another way to look at it is just using this xk minus x hat where lambda k is just the norm of xk minus x hat okay now again plays an important role in the optimality conditions it's always closed regardless of the properties of x and when x is convex this set is convex now remember um, this is not always convex it's only convex when the set is convex the normal cone is always convex okay so here are both cones together so this is the original set okay now remember you might say oh well look you told me it wasn't the thing is in this case it happens that it is convex but in general it's not not true so this tangent cone is this is the tangent cone corresponding to this set this is the normal cone and if what is interesting about this is if you take the dual of the tangent cone and the negative that that's equal to the normal cone if the set is convex yes is this statement in like the case or is it just a property it's a property so the normal cone the negative of the normal cone always lies in the dual of the tangent cone and you have equality of that when x is convex so i want to make sure everybody understands so if you look at this i draw i'll give you a set i draw the normal cone and the tangent cone if i take the negative of the normal cone what is the negative of the normal cone the negative of the normal cone just takes and moves it to the other side it reflects it right so the essentially what you get is if you had this this would be the normal cone this would be some tangent cone in this um sorry the, the dual of the tangent this is the tangent cone this is the dual of the tangent cone t star and then what we have is a negative of the normal cone sorry it should be here lies inside the dual of the tangent cone okay so negative of the normal cone lies in the dual of the tangent cone if the set is convex these sets are actually equal i mean these sets as in the dual of the tangent cone and the normal cone. yes fabio um so try to see where to try and see if i can um trying to see how to um i'll have to think about it but i'm uh, usually it happens
I'm trying to think, but on the fly, I can think of what, a simple example, but I'm not sure. I would check it. Okay, so if I have a set like this, right, so you can have cones that go like this, like this. So the union is the, is the tangent cone. But I'll have to check some if there are other ones that I can cleanly give you. It was a perfect question. But then when you say, let's say, axis convex. Yeah. It's equal to. It's equal to the dual of the tangent cone. See? When x is convex, right. these sets are identical. And if it's not convex, it always lies inside? Or? It always lies inside. Okay. okay. Always lies inside. So yeah, it always, yeah, it always contains it. When it's convex, it's equality. Okay. So again, a, a quick reminder of, so the, we talked about this a bit early, but I, I'll put this out again. So a point that is an interior point is one where you can draw a ball around it and the ball lies entirely in the set, right? So X is said to be an interior point of X, right? So for instance, if I gave you X as, then the, in, I refer to the set of all interior points as int of X and it's just zero comma one, okay? X hat is said to be an accumulation point of X if there exists a sequence that converges to it. Okay. The closure of the set X is a set of all accumulation points. It's denoted by closure of X. And the boundary of X is the intersection of the closure and the closure of its complement. So just to give you an indication of what I mean by that is. So let's give you a quick example. So if I gave you this x is 0, 1. What is x? So the closure of x is 0, 1. x star is okay. Closure of x star intersection closure of x is okay so that's the boundary okay so in general the boundary the boundary just represents um, so for instance if you take a you know simple sets like balls boundary is just the surface of the ball Okay, if you took something like this, the boundary is just this. Your question? So, the definition of the dual cone yes. requires the definition of oh, the uh, sorry, this is, I should be clear, this is not star. Complement, I'm sorry, I apologize. So, X complement is Rn minus X. So, basically, everything outside the set. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Okay. So convex and conical hulls. So the convex combination of a set of vectors is just a linear combination with weights alpha i to alpha m, if you have m vectors, where the sum of the alphas is 1 and alphas are non-negative. Okay. So let's, let's uh, take some simple cases of that. So for instance, if I gave you x1 is 1, 1, and x2 is 0, 0, then the convex combination of this is alpha 1, 1 plus 1 minus alpha 0, 0, which is just basically going to be alpha, alpha. So if I have two points like this, Right? It's just basically these are convex. This for any alpha is a convex combination of these two points. If I had three points, I get some point in the middle. And what is this point? This would be basically, you know, for instance, if I had 0, 0 
plus 1 0 uh, alpha 2 plus alpha 3 0 1 is equal to alpha 1 sorry alpha alpha 2 alpha 3. Right, so just a point here, which is alpha two, alpha three, right? And as long and because we know that alpha two and alpha three have to be less than one, we know this is always inside this because look at this set. This is one zero, zero one. Okay. So the co the so the convex hull is a set of all convex combinations. The original set need not be convex, right? So for instance, in fact, you can see this. If I gave you a set of points, if I gave you a set of points, essentially the convex combination of these, so a bunch of points, the convex combination is, of the set of all convex combinations is, should we take a break? Okay, let's take a break. You